So, hey, welcome everybody to Lightning Talks. Um, we'll do it like this. Uh, we have the Lightning Talks over there. Um, in general, the, the theme is a Lightning Talk is uh, five minutes and a live demo is 10 minutes, but if you're faster, it's no problem. Uh, we have probably enough time, so if you overrun a couple of seconds, uh, I won't immediately cut you off, or me, in case it's me. Um, but if you're really running over time, then we'll have to get to the next person. Um, there's a microphone here, so you can uh, speak into it. We don't need to cable you up. There's a clicker here to advance slides, or you just use the, uh, the notebook. Uh, I'll try to uh, switch slides. I think I have all of the slides now for that. Uh, maybe not, not Wookiees, so we can just, at the end, uh, quickly switch uh, notebooks. Um, um, so yeah, without, is there any other questions about the process? No. Yeah? What, what should I move, this? Ah, mm -hmm. makes sense. So we'll see, the, the, the resolution is just slightly off here. I hope it works, I'm sorry. Um, if there's a problem, it's my fault, then maybe we have to switch notebooks. Okay, so uh, first up is uh, Martin. Very good. Um, talking about Omimo. Okay. Um, this is uh, not a technical talk, but a purely promotional talk. Um, I try this one. No. This? Yeah. No. What? <laughs> ah. Okay. The pointer needs to be inside of the content. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Uh, Omemo uh, um, is um, now well supported in Debian, and I like to promote this a little bit. Uh, Omemo, what is it? It's end-to-end uh, -end encryption for XMPP or Java. Um, everybody knows OTR, but OTR uh, does not work when you have multiple devices or uh, on offline contacts. Um, you probably know it from conversations, a well-known um, application for Android for XMPP, and uh, all the yeah, <laughs> the uh, algorithm uh, uh, comes from Signal. And uh, yeah, Matrix uses practically the same, just under a different name. Uh, it's called OLM. And MegOLM, MegOLM, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, it's all the same, more or less. Um, and uh, there are apps for Android and iOS, um, programs for desktop and web clients, which do support it. So in Debian 9, we had only one XMPP client supporting Omemo, and uh, fortunately in uh, Debian Buster this will improve, and this is exactly the promotion I like to do. Please try them out, Dino, C+, and even on the command line and console there's uh, JP. Can you read this, actually? Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so you can even have this encryption on the command line um, and in two different uh, console clients. So please um, encrypt, uh, use the stuff, um, help us in the, with the packaging documentation, shoot many screens and try things. Thank you. What's the question? Can you, can you repeat the question? And go to yeah, there was a, a question about Pigeon, and in fact there is a uh, plugin for Pigeon supporting Omemo, but it's not yet in Debian. So uh, sorry for all the old timers using Pigeon. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> it, it, it has been said that it doesn't work. So a good reason to not have it in Debian also. <laughs>
because Debian has only software that works, right? <laughs> Okay, thanks, Martin. So next up is uh, me. Well, I'll try to do a live demo. Let's, let's see if it works. Well, this didn't work. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll quickly talk a bit. About Petroni. Um, so in general, this is about um, fully automatic PostgreSQL uh, high availability with Debian. And um, this is something that I've been working on a bit um, on company time. Um, first up, packaging the, the software, which is called Petroni, which I get to in a second. And second, trying to integrate it into Debian because Petroni is cloud native. So it's usually run in Docker containers and um, it uses other stuff. So it wasn't uh, very easy. Um, maybe some of you were in, in Christoph's talk about how, how Debian packages uh, Postgres or the Postgres ecosystem. And we have this uh, PostgreSQL common uh, wrapper and Petroni was totally unaware of that. Um, it's like installing into opt basically. Um, so there was, some, there was quite some work to do to get it integrated. Uh, as an overview, it's a project by Zalando, the company that makes or that sells shoes, basically. Um, MIT license, it's Python. And basically, it configures Postgres instances and uh, the replication between them, and then uh, does failover or switchover. And how it basically works is it uses uh, etcd or Zookeeper or Consul, but etcd is maybe the most easiest or well-known, or you already have it in your data center, uh, as a distributed consensus store, DCS. So it's basically a key value store. It uses the, the raft algorithm um, for leader election. So you can be sure that there is only one leader, and uh, that leader has a time to live. And uh, it's constantly updating its leader key in, in the key value store. And if it doesn't happen anymore, then there is a new leader election. I'll uh, demonstrate that. Um, and in general, uh, this, this raft algorithm uh, makes sure that there's really only one uh, member of the cluster writing a particular um, configuration set. Um, this lets us a lot avoid split brain scenarios um, when you have an uneven number of nodes. Usually you would have a three node uh, Petroni cluster. Um, there are several other infos that it stores in, in etcd or in the other dcs so it's like the, the cluster status and which uh, at which time or at which point in the transaction lock a particular uh, standby is so you can figure out which one is the the closest uh, to a primary in case you need to pr uh, promote anyone um, what you can optionally do and i'm not going to show that is you can pour, for example it, it well patroni exposes a rest api and you can use for example ha proxy to route incoming connections to the, to the primary or if they are read-write connections or to a secondary if they're read-only connections for um, read scaling. And even more optionally, you can use ConfD, but I think ConfD isn't even Debian yet uh, to, to write the HA proxy configuration, but you can just use a configuration management system or just whatever you want. So. This is the very complicated way if it works, but you can get you can all basically the HA proxy stuff. So you have uh, a master and a replica, or rather two replicas usually, all running um, Postgres. And then you have this Petroni. Unfortunately, Petroni does not have a logo yet. So you have a Petroni um, instance um, sitting on top of it, like an operator um, pattern in, in, in Kubernetes, uh, and managing the Postgres instance. And uh, they're talking to etcd or Petroni is talking to SCD, both of them, 
and there's a replication going on. So in Debian, most of the patches are now in. 155 is the almost current version. I think 156 has been released a couple of weeks ago, so it's in, Debian, in Buster now. And we have integrated it into PostgreSQL com. So for example, now Petroni instances show up in uh, PGLS clusters. Um, the binaries are where you would expect them in a Debian Postgres install. The log files are there. Um, one problem is that PostgreSQL conf is currently, uh, or Petroni still likes to um, manage this one. So you have to make sure that it's not overwriting whatever you wanted there. And for more information, you can see those. There's a blog post and there is a um, Ansible playbook. Okay. So let's see. Um, I'll, uh, so what I'll do, I'll start, um, I'll have a couple of Buster based uh, LXC containers and I'll start with uh, starting up a so-called master container, which basically just runs uh, etcd. Um, I'll just deploy the, the master part of that in the, in the Ansible. Uh, from the Ansible playbook, so it's, it's it's basically just installing etcd at this point. So, and then we will start three LXC containers called PG1, PG2, and PG3. So now we have these four containers running. On that, on that network. And um, I'm going to um, install Petroni on all of them. So let's see, I'm going to cut and paste a bit here. Um, I'm going to copy this over for good measure. And then I'm going to install first postgres.com on every one of them. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell PostgreSQL conf not to create a, a Postgres cluster immediately because Petroni will do that. And then I'm just going to install Petroni and Postgres. Now I'll copy over the so-called DCS uh, file, it's a YAML file, and we'll put in the master IP address. It's already there. So I'll um, copy this over. And the other thing I'm going to copy over from one of the classes is the config yaml in and I'm going to quickly allow for network installation and that's also here already. Mm -hmm. So um, at that point I'm going to uh, do the installation. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have now messed it up in the sense that it's already installed. <laughs> well, what I can show you is that, well, it's not very interesting to actually in install Petroni. So what we have here is, um, is, uh, the Petroni um, things are running, so I'm going to log into each of them and start up the Petroni instance I was creating before, which is similar to Postgres, it's, it's called 11 for the version and test. So we have one here. Um, we will jump to this one started coming one from PG3 
and one incoming from PG1. So what you see now that this one is the leader and um, I can basically now um, connect to either one of the three saying I want to connect to the, to the writable Postgres instance. So I'll just run that in the loop. So you see that this is um, just returning the server address, which is the, the leader now. And um, if I'm shutting down the leader from outside, because for example, it has a failure, That's, thanks for telling me. So basically I'm just shutting it down. Too bad. I'm <laughs> um, sorry, this was, yeah, this didn't work, my password. Okay, anyway, we have to shut down the leader. Uh, no. Wait a second. What are we gonna do? I'm going to show you first, get for just for very quickly, the switch over functionality. So I'm logging in to either one of them and then I'm telling it to please switch to PG1 as the leader. And you can see now that the IP address has changed to 185, which is the new leader. And now I can, again, switch it off. And, well, it's off, so there is a failure. But after a couple of seconds, Petroni should be able to um, Recover from this and elect a new leader. There we go. So now there was a leader election and then PG2 is not a new leader. And what I, again, you can connect here to 191. That's uh, basically the JIT out of it. Uh, you will have, so basically you have still, you can install this on, on three machines and uh, if one goes down, it will just immediately go to the next one. You have to configure your clients somehow, but that's pretty easy with newer Postgres versions, or you can use HAProxy or something. And uh, once you start up the old one again, you can put it back into the cluster. Yeah, I just started it, but yeah, thanks for mentioning that, I'm sorry. And it's back there, and it will automatically figure out that there's some problem and reclone and be back um, in, in business. So we can do another switch over and it's going to be back to the master and you can see it's going to. Okay, that's, that's basically it, thanks. So next up, next up is Adam. That works. Uh, you can advance. Uh, it's okay. almost working. Mm, great. Here, here's the clicker. Okay. Uh, well. So yeah. So next up, Adam Borowski about PMAM. Persistent. Uh, yeah. But this is the first slide, right? This is the first slide. Yeah. 
So well, um, uh, there's some stuff uh, persistent memory, and um, uh, uh, there will be uh, well some software support is uh, already in, but most uh, will be coming. And uh, at uh, this moment, uh, there are just uh, libraries that are not used by, by anything. And before I ask you to uh, add support for uh, those libraries, I need to at least uh, describe what it is for. Uh, well, um, the idea is to put uh, um, some things other than uh, ordinary DRAM on um, uh, the slots uh, because they are a lot faster than uh, PCI uh, can be. Uh, and uh, um, uh, this way, as you have the, the, the pyramid of, 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 of uh, speed versus cost, then uh, if you have uh, all the other disk or, or flash, uh, then basic memory is a lot faster than... Um, okay, you than speak in the microphone, sorry. It's yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, a lot faster than... Uh, um, uh, uh, than uh, flash disks, but still slower than uh, than RAM. But at least it's um, uh, byte uh, addressable. Uh, yeah, this is easier. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, so um, uh, there was uh, 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 other implementation like uh, NVIDIA and uh, from uh, Hewlett Packard and so on, but uh, uh, the one I have experience with is, uh, is um, uh, 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 named Obtain DC Persistent Memory and, um, from Intel, just for a conflict of interest. So, yeah, uh, well. So, um, what can be used for? Well, uh, for existing uh, programs, you can use it as normal, as normal uh, volatile memory. Well, uh, um, you can ask why, why use it as volatile if it's persistent, but um, there is uh, no way that uh, you uh, can get many terabytes uh, of memory in, in one machine. Uh, if, uh, for example, in the, the first implementation you have um, up to half a terabyte per, per, per DDR4 stick, so um, if you have six terabytes of me memory for the cheapest uh, um, uh, 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 motherboard that can uh, uh, use them uh, at the moment, uh, so it's but um, uh, uh, there is a completely transparent hardware mode, um, uh, 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 which uh, takes all uh, all um, uh, normal RAM and takes uses it as a sort of ca a cache. But it's more like uh, uh, like swap. But uh, that's. Um, uh, while that's, uh, um, of course, fa faster than swapping to a disk, uh, it's, um, uh, the hardware is quite stupid because um, it doesn't know um, that uh, the data you already processed can be um, uh, forgotten uh, and uh, um, uh, you would rather want uh, some other data um, that was not uh, least recently uh, used. So it evicts data that what uh, you want hot, but uh, um, doesn't, uh, uh, but uh, keeps uh, what you would want um, uh, go. So you can use it uh, manually. This uh, requires um, uh, uh, software changes. There are multiple libraries uh, uh, of, the, of this uh, one. I would comment mankind because of um, uh, um, uh, it. Ca it knows uh, which memory is on wha what um, NUMA node, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, most uh, um, new machines um, have uh, NUMA, uh, not um, just uh, multi socket ones. For example. For um, example, uh, recent um, uh, the desktop processor for AMD have, have four uh, NUMA nodes in one socket and so on. And you, then if you can get um, uh, NUMA support, you, you want it even without persistent memory. And, and there's um, um, a part, kernel part set that hasn't yet been, been merged that uh, does the best of the two worlds. If you don't uh, um, uh, tell it anything, it uh, does the um, list recently with order, or you can tell it which uh, data uh, you want uh, to be kept hot. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, well, you can also it, 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 it as a, a normal disk. Uh, it's um, uh, um, uh, a lot faster than um, uh, than the best um, flash disk, but uh, uh, there, are, there is uh, um, uh, uh, one problem because uh, of um, uh, uh, this is memory, so its bytes are disabled. So if you uh, write uh, something, then uh, a power loss can uh, stop uh, a write at, at any unexpected uh, moment. And, and a lot of software, usually databases, uh, actually uses uh, that um, sector atomicity. Uh, so there is a sector mode that can emu emulate that, but that, that costs uh, some speed. Unless you are sure that um, all software has, has been fixed, that the uh, um, database don't suffer from that problem anymore, and that's um, a problem that uh, uh, um, uh, upstreams and maintainers of um, uh, databases would have to um, uh, find out and fix, then uh, um, uh, you don't have to pay that penalty anymore. Uh, and there's an extra good is that uh, there, there's a mode named DAX, which uh, um, uh, lets uh, you access um, the, the data on the disk, on the, on, on the mem memory uh, directly, without e even having to copy it to, um, to the RAM. There's no page cache uh, and so on. You, uh, you um, read the data directly when it is uh, stored. But it, still uh, 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 mostly compatible with uh, 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 existing um, uh, uh, software. Uh, but the real fun starts with you start writing uh, native um, software for persistent memory. Um, uh, unfortunately, because uh, most of you don't uh, yet have um, 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 those memories to, and can at most uh, um, emulate it with software, then um, that uh, software is coming quite uh, slowly. But uh, um, uh, the idea is that, that you memory map um, uh, the, the whole disk. Uh, it's quite uh, a bit of problem on 32-bit architectures because uh, if the first step is to uh, memory map uh, six terabytes, then then uh, the, um, 30 bits, it's a bit uh, problematic. So I'm afraid uh, I, there won't be libraries for 30 bit uh, arcs. Uh, so um, uh, um, uh, you can have, uh, 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 instead of, of marshalling data and, and saving it, you, you operate it um, uh, all the time on the, on the live data that, that's, um, that's uh, persistent, but you need to, um, um, uh, to, to order the, the, the flashes, or, um, otherwise um, a, a crash would uh, um, uh, have uh, some data still in, uh, um, in the CPU caches. There are some um, uh, instructions that uh, the library that does behind um, uh, um, uh, when, when, you, when you ask it, uh, and uh, they, uh, they don't have to um, uh, read uh, the kernel at all, uh, because uh, going to, to the kernel, uh, it's quite a someday service as co co compared to uh, memory accesses, so um, you can have um, um, uh, the data that, that, that's fully persistent at, at, at all time, uh, without a, a single syscall after um, uh, uh, that has been um, uh, set up. But this software need, uh, needs to be um, packaged and integrated and so on, and that will be our uh, job. Well, uh, I'll tell you more uh, in Curitiba. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is Jan. Nee, das geht doch, alles gut. Ja, ich muss noch mal kurz auf Anfang. 
So I, I gave this talk the, the title Providing the Smallest Fingerprint in the Web. And before starting with this, I may have to uh, introduce me a little bit to understand why I go this way. Um, my, my professional background is technical product management for high-tech products. That means I'm working for companies like the, yeah, look at the, the tech ducks in, in Germany. These are my clients. And when I'm working for them, I have to be invisible for their competitors. And the competitors should not find out what I'm look more or less looking for. And that drives me, um, or that drove me to set up a kind of virtual machines plus um, laptop configuration that is, is handleable for me um, and uh, s get the data that I need and provide the minimum data to the website that I'm looking at. Um, maybe something about my background. My background is definitely technical. I have uh, an electrical engineering plus uh, computer science and I don't have any trouble to dive into the technical details, but nevertheless, I, I usually don't want to. Um, this is what I've already mentioned. I just want to jump into the details. Um, the, the surrounding is more or less my laptop and... Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is more, or this, this surrounding area here is the, uh, the host system that I'm using and I have two gateways to the outside world, which one is the VPN tunnel and the other one is USB. And let's start with the VPN tunnel. The VPN tunnel and uh, this firewall, it's IP tables based, is um, uh, they're technical link together, which means the, if I start the VPN, the firewall knows which VPN type I'm using, TCP, UDP, or OBFS, and it opens the, rec the necessary ports and nothing else. Uh, the firewall itself never ever answers to any ping, so this system is more or less invisible in something like the, the local Wi-Fi here. And this is something that also caught me here because this, uh, this, uh, the router expects that I answer some sort of ping and my system doesn't answer and it kicks me out after 30 minutes. So I have to find a way to, recon uh, to reconnect it and this is some sort of a cron job that already, already does it. This USB connector is something like a must have for me because I have to make sure that I get backups of my data. And when I talk about backups of my data, I'm talking about approximately 200 gigabytes which is uh, synchronized with R-Sync on a portable USB stick daily and uh, a full copy is made every week on two hard drives and the, the, the data of the two hard drives is identical and compared with diff. So I need something like a USB connection that is fast. And this uh, is the user data that I am, I am backing up. So let's look at the middle part. The middle part is simply a Tor browser located on the host system plus two virtual machines. And these virtual machines are some sort of the templates and I named them uh, MinAds and WSafe. Um, let me, s oh Jesus, this is still an old, an old picture inside. I did not send you the update. Sorry, that was my fault. Um, let me start with the safe version. The safe version is a virtual machine based on Debian 9 and I deleted all the stuff that I don't need, which is uh, the office package and something else that comes around. The, the virtual machines just have uh, Tor browser bundle installed and Firefox installed. And uh, the Firefox is configured in a way that it uses the, the proxy port of the Tor browser. And then I go with Firefox through Tor, through IP tables to the outside world. Firefox itself has two different configurations. One is just as Firefox comes when you install it, and I've just added a user.js with some minimal configurations. It deletes all the data after exit, and that's it. And the, the second uh, configuration is based on the stuff that the folks in this called pri privacyhandbuch.de recommended. I think it's very well known here in the German area. And, um, this is the, the, the hardened version. And if a website now says, when I connect it with Tor browser, don't get access, then I say, okay, fine. Next step is Firefox using the one with the privacy handbook stuff. And if this doesn't work, I take the other profile with the uh, minimal, um, or just with a very tiny change configuration. And if they also don't let me in, I switch to this virtual machine, the Wmin adds one, and what you should cross out in mind right now is this Tor browser. This link does not exist. It's just the Firefox with the two configurations that I've already mentioned. And then I start also with the, 
with the safest version that includes the stuff from the privacy handbook, and then I take the, uh, the standard configuration. So at least the minimum stuff that I have to protect my identity is the VPN tunnel, which is always up and running, and IP tables make sure that no data bypasses this tunnel. And that's a way, let's say, to, to do some sort of digital uncovering yourself stepwise and see how long it takes until you get the data you need. Because it's not an option for me to say, oh, what, folks, I've hardened my PC, I've hardened my browser, and if a website doesn't let me in, I don't want to see it because I, I have to get the data. Based on this configuration, I did some, uh, some uh, I tried to get some data. This is, again, what I, what I did in the when hardening the stuff, and this is again what I mentioned right now about the configuration, you can read it if you want to. Um, as I mentioned before, the, I have these virtual machines that I showed here. These are some sort of a template, and in the background runs a cron job, and this cron job duplicates the, um, the virtual machines to make sure that I always have a clone available, which I can use for just one job. Uh, and when the job is done, I'm going to close it and delete it. And what you may see here is that there exists some clones and the, the, name, the base name is always the same and it has some sort of a name tag at the end. And if I delete a page, the cron job just says, oh, there's missing one, I'm going to recreate one. So this goes pretty fast. And the, the tricky stuff was these two um, op uh, options that I've, I've uh, made in bold here, which is mode all and register. Mode all says um, create a new MAC address and uh, make a full copy of the, of the template and register it with this, uh, with this uh, interface here. This is how it comes up. You need uh, some sort of a good resolution because the resolution of the web of this virtual machines is based on the 14 inch system. And I did some, some investigations about what is going on if I use a different operating system for the tower browser. It says there's no difference. The data comes from panopticlick.eff.org. And let me highlight something else. What showed up here right now, this uh, set in italic, um, is the, the minimal configuration and it says that if I use my configuration that routes the Firefox through Tor, the result gets a little bit worse. And I think this is uh, because it, it has some stuff from Tor inside. The second or the third thing here is I did some tests with my standard resolution using Firefox and Tor. Uh, and it shows you that there is some sort of an impact if the resolution changes, so your privacy gets worse if you leave these mostly used um, screen resolutions from a, a standard laptop. And this is almost it. So this is what I'm doing. If you have any questions, feel free to call me. Next up, what uh, is Alex? We have to... Can, should you use the microphone? Okay, perfect. Perfect. Uh, it's me again. Hi. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll go to this side. The cross is uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I go to this. I went to this talk, and everything I got was this little cross. So um, yeah, hi. Um, Unfortunately, I did nothing done of the things I wanted to do, uh, but I got some new stuff to do. Um, 
um, based on our talks yesterday in the, to, at lunch and Hilko's talk um, about um, pack sta pack station, um, we decided that we want to make PPAs finally happening. And um, yeah. Um, here's what's, what's roughly our plan is. Um, we are currently collecting ideas at this pad. Um, after the mini -dep conf, I will transfer this pad to um, our Debian wiki, where we are collecting some architectural ideas, some um, yeah, some problems, something that's already been done. Um, we will have to evaluate what's already happened at other Debian rates, like pure as is there something we can reuse for PPAs, or do we have to do everything on our own, and so on. And um, we already decided that we will have a sprint in autumn, um, probably at Zipgate in Düsseldorf. Thank you very much um, for offering the room. Um, so um, expect the mail on Debian Devil from me soonly, where I'm asking for input and um, will provide some poll um, where we can choose a date for the sprint and everyone is invited to help us. We hope that we can up come up with a prototype after the sprint. It will be on a weekend from Friday to Sunday. Um, but um, if that doesn't work out, at least we will, that we will have a plan and an archite architecture about how PPA is integrated in Salsa can look like. Yeah, that's basically all for me. So please send us feedback uh, to my mail. And um, if it's enough feedback, I will use my list master power to create a Debian PPA mailing list and um, to get things tunneled um, in the better lists and Debian Devil. So uh, yeah, that's all for me. Any questions? If you have questions, go to the left. No? no? Perfect. OK. <laughs> Super. So um, yeah, it's working. You're taking your own. Amongst yourselves, we've got video. I just it's just the best round of audio. So different. Yeah, I've got lots of, lots of applications to show people. Um, how do you get that out of the stack? Get this. I can actually see the thing.
something. What was it? This one, yeah. Can you can you now try to actually the cloman? No, this one he doesn't want to go to me. Actually, does he? Uh, no, he doesn't. He doesn't want to know. Do it to the other one. Because maybe that's going to turn into something that's different. That's not that fun, though. Yeah. Well, then you have to get turn yourself on. Oh, oh. Oh, no, it works. Oh, Only. Just, right. Just to wait. Yeah. Maybe. Or oh, you touch it. That's fine. Anyway. Okay. Right. So Sorry about that. Is that actually on the screen? Oh, well, we'll see how this goes. So, um, I shouldn't have volunteered for this at the last minute and carefully arranged things. This Talk may or may not fit into five minutes. We'll see how it goes. So, um, slightly different from our usual fare. Um, uh, I'm a caver. I've been caving for a long time. Uh, this is me in uh, oh, the early 90s when I still had hair. Uh, and that's me last year, so I'm still at it. I really ought to have learned. But that, by the way, is the wind coming out of that hole. We were really quite... Oh, wow. Uh, quite excited the day we found that. So, uh, this is just a uh, like, nice picture of just... For those people who think caving is always tiny and miserable, sometimes it's like this. A tiny little caver. Really uh, okay, right. Fair enough. And maybe I should do this if I'm going to keep turning around. Can we do that? Yep. Uh, so, um, so I got into free software because I started writing some cave survey software in 1990, which we decided to GPL, newfangled thing. Um, and when I became a Debian developer seven or eight years later, I thought I should probably put my survey software in the distro I use. So just to explain to people who know nothing about cave surveying, um, the point is you go underground and measure some distances to work out where your cave goes, and you come back with a scrappy little piece of paper like this with a lot of numbers on and dirt uh, and some pictures, which don't make much sense, and you want to produce a nice survey to work out where your cave goes. So that, for example, in this case, you can see there's some cave and some cave and a little gap, which is probably quite exciting to pot holders who really, really like joining caves together to make bigger caves. So back in the 70s, um, having collected that data, you got to... Oh, that's absolutely illegible, isn't it? Well, I'm sorry, but that's, that's a hand-drawn survey. You used a big piece of paper uh, and worked things out with the calculator and, and drew up what you were trying to survey. But obviously, we all got computerized eventually. Um, so this is kind of vintage of the software I've packaged. This is the years they got into Debian. So Servex was 2001, Therium was 2003, 
uh, and we'll just have a quick look at those uh, as I have a mo. Uh, Cloud Compare is one that actually I started trying to package in 2014, but it turned out it had non-free bits in it, and I spent a long time going back and forth with the author, going, please, can you change it so that your software, which is amazing, doesn't have this tiny non-free piece in it? Uh, and he did, eventually, like three years later, and eventually somebody else got around to uploading it. Um, so this is uh, Therian. So uh, to get away from the actually drawing it up on a piece of paper, so actually, let's just have a quick play with the tools. So. Uh, some software which is the wrong size. Anyone know what the XFCE key for fit to the screen is? Is it F10? Anyway, so this is uh, having got your your cave into the computer, you can spin it round and have a look, and you can look at it in a plan view and elevation, and you can click on a point and say how far is that bit of cave? Oops, that bit of cave from that bit of cave. And down the bottom, there's a distance. This is incredibly useful information if you're uh, trying to work out where you are. So that's what this was like for about 15 years. Uh, and then, of course, we got we finally taught it about um, geolocation. So uh, suddenly, you can put things in the real world. Which so this is this is this is our cave system after 40 years um, of. So that is what 136 kilometers of pothole looks like. It's all very confusing. Uh, and if we like, we can turn on the entrances and go, oh my god, there's quite a lot of entrances. <laughs> um, and then this over here, the other bit of cave, so this is the second longest cave in Austria now, and that's the longest cave in Austria, which is another 140 kilometers. And as you can see, they're not actually very far apart now, which again is the sort of thing that excites potholers. Uh, and uh, so once you've got geolocation, you can do things like turn the terrain on, and now you're starting to get quite nice um, Modeling of, of like what's going on, you can you can see the lake surface down there and where you are in the mountain. Um, so, back to uh, so this is drawing without it's a drawing drawing on the computer. So the whole s process is now computerized. There's no bits of paper involved, um, and that's what Therian lets you do. So that's uh, that's an elevation view and that's a plan view. And also, it has its own fancy viewer, which is even scarier than the. So this one, you can you can drop a map onto your terrain surface, and you can see your little caves underneath. And uh, if I could drive it, I could zoom in and out and go, oh look, okay. So this is quite nice visualization software now. Uh, it's an awful lot of work to get that to come out, but it, it does look snazzy. Um, so that was kind of mid two thousands. Where do we get to? Um, don't have it in for time. Uh, yeah, uploaded some packages. Uh, so there's another thing called uh, Tunnel, which is Java-based software. It basically does the same thing, and that's what we actually use in Austria, which annoys me intensely. Uh, then there's a thing called DX Tool. So we got digital eventually. The instruments went digital as well. Uh, this is a laser gadget which um, does the distance and the angles, uh, and it will Bluetooth them to uh, a phone or whatever. Or if you want to download to Linux, you need a tool. So that's what DX Tool does. It's just a serial protocol. Um, I'm still trying to package some, so one of the things you have to do is calibrate that device, and uh, calibration has involved a Windows box or an Android box for the last decade, which has pissed me off intensely. Uh, it is now possible on Linux, but the software's not quite in Debian yet. Um, I started in 2008, it'll be working soon. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's also KVIEW, which is uh, basically the same thing in, uh, in your browser, because everything has to work in JavaScript these days. Um, and that would be in Debian, except that our version of 3.js is too old. So I need a newer one, and then we can upload that. And I spent the last uh, two years trying to package Caveware, which is a thing, again, primarily built for Windows and Mac people. It's quite nice software. But unfortunately, it uses QBS. And it turns out nothing in Debian uses QBS. There's, there's me, basically, with this. And it's got like six dependencies, which all use QBS. So I ended up having to write the wiki page for how to make a Debian package use QBS. So this is what your rules file ends up looking like. There's reams of crap, because dpackage and everything just doesn't really work the same way. So QBS is kind of a replacement for QMake. Um, the only problem is, whilst having got all this working and then worked it all out, like l about eight months ago, they decided they're deprecating QBS, and the new people that bought QT aren't paying for it anymore. And you go, oh, for fuck's sake. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of annoying. Uh, so, anyway, so far I've packaged DeWalls and LibSquish. So, LibSquish, so this is a little side effect of why this packaging really obscure software is actually useful. So, we did get QBS working in Debian, um, and it had LibSquish in it, which is an obscure graphics library for 
it's kind of graphics that graphics cards all do themselves these days, but they didn't used to. Um, and it turns out there were seven embedded copies of LibSquish in different bits of Debian, all with a different patch for whatever purpose they needed. So I ended up spending months fishing them all out, finding out what the differences were, um, collecting one set of patches that actually fitted together, uh, sending it to the new upstream because it had moved. Uh, and to be fair, that guy was helpful, took all the patches, so now there's one LibSquash in Debian, and all those embedded things are removed. So, yeah. so <laughs> this is why it takes me four years to get something into Debian, because I actually tried doing it properly, unlike everybody else, and it takes forever. Ooh. All those people who went, oh, a slightly different version of LibSquish, I'll just leave it embedded, because that's so much easier. So anyway, I'm, I'm working my way through this pile, uh, and that's basically it, I think. Um, yeah. I could show you more cave survey software, but you know. Um, actually, we'll just have a moment on this as it's the last talk. So this is when you've got all those tiny little, oh, you, you imagine bits of cave. Uh, if I there, it's a bit better. Ah, yeah, okay. So um, each, each, each of the, remember that bit of paper I showed you with little snippets of drawings? You end up with all these little snippets of drawings that went off the page and you scan them in and then you draw around them with this thing and basically this is a compiler that you say you know at the end of this bit joins to the end of that bit and then that bit connects onto there uh, and then if you combine that with the center line to actually set them in 3D space you can get nice pictures at the end um, so it's, it's all marvelously labor intensive but it's marginally better than doing it on a piece of paper not the first time but the next year when you come back and it goes off the edge of the page so I used to spend the 90s every year drawing the same fucking five kilometers of thing and then a bit more on a slightly different size page. And eventually you go, this is mad, I need a computer <laughs> so that I can just like make the page bigger. Uh, so this is what we now have. So Debian is much better for cave surveying than any other distro because we have all this unbelievably obscure software in it. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Wookie, and thanks to all the speakers again. The lighting talks are over, almost on time, so thanks. <laughs>